Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. Um, as Eileen said, I'm Jennifer Stabler. I'm um, actually an archaeology planner coordinator within the historic preservation section in the Prince George's County Planning Department. Um, in Prince George's and Montgomery Counties, um, the Maryland National Capital uh, Park and Planning Commission serves as um, planning staff for, for the planning boards of each county. We're separate organizations. Uh, we're all one organization, but we have separate departments. And I am in the historic preservation section um, within the planning department. Okay, so um, back in 1981, uh, there was a historic preservation, um, there were, uh, historic preservation program was established in Prince George's County. And um, we have had three separate historic sites and districts plan. The original historic sites and districts plan was established in 1981. And there were a number of sites that were added to this plan that are regulated by the Historic Preservation Ordinance, which is subtitle 29 of our county code. And basically, they're, um, they're mainly um, structures. Uh, we do have a couple of archaeological sites that are uh, historic sites. Um, and there are some individual cemeteries that are designated as historic sites. But they are prim primarily um, structures and churches and uh, things like that. So the plan was updated once again in 1991. And the most recent um, update was done in, we worked on it from about 2008 to 2000. It was approved in June of 2010 by our Prince George's County Planning Board. And what the Historic Preservation Ordinance did was it established a um, Historic Preservation Commission. So we have nine members on our commission, and they have various um, specialties. Um, most of our commissioners have some background in historic preservation, um, it's, which is a plus. We have several realtors on our board. Um, there's, uh, I think it's required to have a uh, representative of a local mun municipality. Uh, we have people with um, experience in the building industry and uh, agriculture. Um, we used to have one uh, man who was a local farmer. Um, so they have various um, backgrounds, but they have all had, are supposed to have um, an appreciation for historic preservation. Um, so again, um, this is, um, yeah, the Historic Preservation Commission is established through Subtitle 29 and the various um, uh, specialties that they have. So um, our archaeological regulations are a little more recent than our Historic Preservation Commission. Um, there was just an explosion of development in the early 2000s. And there was a particular concern with, um, with the destruction of especially African-American resources, which are largely in Prince George's County, resources prior, that date prior to the uh, Civil War. Um, those African-American resources are mainly represented by archaeological sites. We don't have many standing structures that are related to African-American resources prior to the Civil War. So because our county was becoming majority African-American, the African-American community really organized and they, um, they got the planning board to um, begin an, an initiative in 2004 where they were beginning to require archaeological surveys um, on subdivision plans that were, um, that were um, submitted to the planning department. So um, that initi initiative began in 2004 and the planning department hired um, a consultant archaeologist to review subdivision plans for effects on archaeological resources. So pretty soon, the development lawyers started looking at this, and they were like, you know, um, there's nothing in the code that says that we're required to do this. So how, you know, why do we have to spend all this money doing archaeological resources when it's not required by the code? So um, in November of 2005, the Historic Preservation Section um, um, drafted some legislation for the planning board and in November of 2005, those regulations were passed and the county council by the um, uh, by the county planning board, and then the county council um, signed those regulations into law. So at that point, um, a position was uh, established in the um, in the planning department for a permanent full-time archaeologist. So at first, um, that position was um, filled by Paula Bienenfeld, who was still under she was still a contract um, employee, and it wasn't until I was hired in um, November of 2006 that we actually had a full-time um, 
staff person, staff archaeologist, who was a permanent member of the planning department. So I'm the first permanent um, archaeologist in the planning department, and I've been in that position since um, actually October of 2006. So I review um, subdivision, subdivision plans that come into the planning department, actually all plans, but we can only require archaeological surveys on properties uh, through the subdivision regulations. We don't have anything in our zoning code, so there are, there are plans, they're called like conceptual site plans and detailed site plans where we cannot require archaeological surveys. But really, um, most, of the, most of these plans have to go through the subdivision process, so that's where we can require the archaeological surveys. And of course, when the archaeologists are out doing these surveys, they should be looking for cemetery sites as well. Uh, okay, so let's move on here. So um, actually back in 2002, um, there was an intern, Rebecca Ballo, who was working with the planning department, and she began working on, um, she started doing a survey in the county of uh, cemeteries because again, the development was picking up and people were really concerned about destruction of these cemeteries um, through the development process. So um, we fortunately had the Prince George's County Genealogical Society had put together, some of you I'm sure are familiar with this um, publication, it's called Stones and Bones. And so they listed, um, through various sources, um, most of the most of the cemeteries in the county, of course, all the churches, ones that are readily identified, but also a great number of family cemeteries. So she used that as her starting point. She went through and she tried to find where all of those cemeteries that are listed in Stones and Bones where they were located. So she started to um, she started to put together a GIS layer. Um, that where she could figure out where the cemeteries were located, she did. She um, established like a, I guess it was more a polygon layer. So she couldn't figure out exactly where the cemetery was on a larger property. So she identified the parcel that the cemetery was located on, just to uh, just to alert people that yes, there's a cemetery somewhere on this parcel. So if a development plan comes in, then you need to be aware that there's a cemetery there. Um, so again, as part of, um, um, and we've had uh, interns, I guess since about 2002, working on this during the summer, trying to um, continue to identify exactly where these cemeteries are and do some type of basic survey on each one. So um, with our most recent update to the Historic Sites and Districts Plan, um, beginning about 2007, 2008, we were able to get a chunk of money uh, from Park and Planning to hire a consultant. We hired um, EHT Traceries to, um, to help us to, um, to go out and document some of these cemeteries and um, record their existing conditions. So again, we started with, um, we really started with the cemeteries where we had no, you know, we had no previous information, but we knew they existed through Stones and Bones. So we started with those cemeteries that we knew of and we just made a list and um, we sent out letters to the property owners um, asking them for permission to access their properties, explaining to them what we were doing. And um, we arranged with our consultant to set up times where they could visit, um, take pictures, record basic information. And they had a, um, a form that was similar to Howard County's. Um, it's just a basic inventory form. They weren't going through and recording individual um, stones and inscriptions and things like that. Um, they were just trying to um, collect basic information. So um, they did a little bit of background research, research first, and some of that was done by me and others in my um, office. Uh, then they actually went out to the site and they used the form to record that basic information. Is there a fence? What type of fence is it? How many markers are there? What type of material are the markers uh, made of? Um, how many stones are there? Do they have inscriptions? Um, what is their condition? Are some broken? Um, and they'd spend about 40 minutes on each site recording this basic information. Uh, and then they had, um, they had a GPS unit where they would, take, um, they would you know, take a reading on the site where we could actually plug it into a GIS layer and get it, its exact location. And uh, we updated, we have a historic preservation database. So we used the information that they collected to update our, our um, historic preservation database. 
So, you know, uh, we have a variety of cemetery types, probably like any other county uh, in the state. Uh, a lot of African-American cemeteries, church cemeteries, mostly family burial grounds. Those are our, um, the, the most that we have. Um, a few Jewish cemeteries, memorial parks, slave cemeteries. Um, those are particularly hard to identify. And um, we have been successful in identifying some of them. And it's mainly through um, local landowners telling us where they are. And there have been a couple of occasions, um, usually when I get a subdivision plan in, I'll do a title search on that property. And sometimes um, cemeteries, even the slave cemeteries, are mentioned in the deed records. Not always, but sometimes we do have a few cases where they are. So it's like, well, we know there's something there. And you know, really, any of these large plantation sites, they're going to have a slave cemetery somewhere. Um, so we, when we get a plan in like that, we really try to figure out where these uh, resources are. Um, we're lucky in Prince George's County um, because our courthouse in the past never burned. So we have our deed, our deed records go all, until recently. We've had a couple of recent fires, but in the past, they. Um, so our records go all the way back to 1696 to the establishment of the county, which which is great for for me because, you know, I can take the chain of title all the way back to the 1690s. Um, so this is just a pie chart of um, the we we've identified about 247 cemeteries. I have about you know five or six more. I know they're there. I'm not exactly sure where they where they are, so I didn't include them in the numbers here. And about 223 of those have been surveyed. And again, um, most of those are just our basic, you know, baseline surveys. They've been visited, they've been photographed, we've collected um, basic information on them. So, um, and they've been put in the in the GIS system. Um, this gives you an idea of the um, the ownership. A, ma a majority of them are privately owned. And of course, those are the ones we have the most problem with because. Not everyone likes someone from a government organization coming on their land and, you know, tromping around their property. Um, so we've had some issues with getting permission, um, especially kind of in the rural areas. A lot of people don't like us coming on their property. But I've been trying to work with some of the local farmers who know other farmers, and I kind of kind of go through them. It's like I guess they feel if oh, if this guy thinks she's okay, then you know I guess it's okay to let her on there. Um, so that helps a lot in trying to get access to these properties. Um, the family-owned cemeteries are the most common, and those are the most often neglected ones. Um, and then the churches are the second largest owners of cemeteries. Most of our church cemeteries are in pretty good condition, um, especially the ones that are still active. We have a couple of cemeteries where the, um, the, um, con you know, the congregation is no longer active, but the property is maintained by um, another church who has sort of um, taken um, ownership of the, the property. Okay. So um, as a result of our cemetery survey that we be began through the most recent historic sites and districts plan, we um, put together the cemetery manual. And um, it's, it's, it's available online. And in your handout, there's a, uh, there's a link to the cemetery manual. And again, it's, it's just a very basic, uh, you know, um, document here, it's very small, and it just gives you, um, it gives, just gives someone um, an idea of how you research a cemetery. And in the back it has some of the forms that we use for the cemetery uh, survey that we did, that someone, you can copy these and you can take them out to the field and you can fill in the information. And um, you know, you can send the form to us and we can plug it in. We have a database, we can just plug everything into our database. It gives you examples of types of tombstones and uh, all kinds of good things, types of fencing and things like that, that you can um, add to your description, you know, if you're going out to do, um, to do a cemetery survey. Um, so our survey findings were guided by recommendations made in the uh, manual, and we also put out a little brochure. I don't think we have any of the brochures left, but um, those were pretty popular. They got scarfed up pretty quickly. Um, so, like I said, we do have a database. We have a historic preservation database, which lists all of our historic sites, but we also have a separate tab for cemeteries. Um, now, some of our historic sites, I'd say about 50 or 60 of our historic sites contain cemeteries, so they're part of that larger historic sites site. And then we have about, I'd say, 10 that are probably just the cemetery, um, but they are historic sites. 
And because we do have our local historic preservation ordinance, um, we have a means to protect cemeteries that are historic sites or a part of a historic site. So um, we can regulate those, but we have all of those other 100 and some that we, we ha really have no authority over. Um, and I guess the only way that we can protect some of those is, is if they come in through the, the development process. Um, again, there's this, um, I guess it's uh, part of our subdivision regulation, subtitle uh, 24.13502, which um, is on the handout that you got um, at the beginning of the session here. And uh, so if a development application comes in, the, cemetery, the, the property owner has to submit to us with their, with their preliminary plan um, application. They have, to, they have to take pictures of the cemetery. They have to tell us what the condition of it is. They have to tell us what type of fencing is there. And we like to have that because that gives us a baseline. At the time this development um, application came in, we have a baseline of what the condition of that cemetery and what's there. So that way we can kind of monitor it through the development process and see if it has been, if it has been impacted by development as time goes on. So you know, we have that baseline. And once the development is finished, we can go out and, and take a look at it and see what the condition is and see if there have been, um, you know, um, if, there's, if there have been effects to the um, cemeteries during the course of development. And they're also supposed to, um, to put a fence around the cemetery. It e either has to be wood, um, I guess brick, or metal. Uh, it has to be put, um, it's, there have been a couple of cases where cemeteries are put on building lots. Those have not been as successful as when they're put on, like if, if um, not all of the developments have a, a homeowners association. Um, so sometimes they have to be put on individual lots. But um, when they do have a, an HOA, we recommend that the cemetery be put on HOA land and then so there's a source of income to upkeep the cemeteries. Okay, so back to the, back to the database. This just shows you some of the uh, general information we collect. Um, this is the Magruder Family Cemetery, which received a grant um, recently um, from the coalition to, um, um, to fix up the cemetery. And it gives you, um, we have planning areas in Prince George's County, so it tells you where the planning area is, um, the ownership, it's private, um, the contact name for the person who is responsible for maintaining it, whether it's active or inactive. Um, the parcel, uh, the parcel number goes in there, um, tax account number, uh, whether it's, um, this will tell you whether it's uh, labeled as a historic resource, a historic site in our historic sites and districts plan. Um, the type, um, private family, plantation, or church, um, and it gives the address. Uh, and you can search this database. In this case, I look for Episcopal churches, and it'll bring up all the Episcopal churches that have cemeteries. Um, so it's, it's, it's very helpful if you want to, you know, um, come up with a list of which, which ones are privately owned. You can make a list of that. So um, this database is very helpful. You can, you can search by various categories. Um, and then, uh, let's see. So down in the right-hand corner, we have a GIS, an online GIS system that anybody, you know, you can, you can access. It's pgatlas.com. Um, and you can click on, so you can click on the PG Atlas icon in the database and it will take you to, um, it'll take you to its location in PG Atlas. It'll take you right there and the little dot marks where the cemetery is. Now, the cemetery layer is now only available on our internal system, so only people who work in the planning department can see that cemetery layer. I've had issues with, um, with management about putting this on the, on the public site. They're afraid that if people know exactly where the cemeteries are, they might go out, and, uh, and I might want to talk to you guys about how you deal with this. Um, they're afraid that people will go out and vandalize the sites, or you know they'll just go on private, you know, go on private property without asking permission, and somebody might get hurt. So there are concerns about that. Um, but we do have it available um, in internally, and so all of our development um, uh, reviewers can can see that layer if they turn it on. 
I mean, I usually do the historic preservation review, so I'm, you know, I'm usually the one who does the review for the cemeteries. But we do have a we do have a GIS point layer available, and this just this is just an example of um, kind of what it looks like. Um, what we've done is we've tried to uh, we tried to get a Maryland Inventory of Historic Properties number for each cemetery, and we're trying to fill out a Maryland Inventory of Historic Properties form that um, will stay on record at the Maryland Historical Trust and in our files, just so there's that information is there at the state level and at the county level. Um, we, uh, we're, we're kind of backed up in filling out those forms and MH, MHT is getting a little, um, you know, restless to get, to get, those, get those forms in, but you know, I kind of do this on the side. I, I can't devote my entire day to doing this. So, um, so we, like I said, we have had interns who have been helping us to fill out these forms and we're gradually trying to get them to the Maryland Historical Trust where th then these forms will be available on their public site where you can view the, the uh, cemetery forms. Um, so here are some of the, here are some of the um, I guess, threats to, uh, to some of these cemeteries. Logging, um, the southern part of our county is still very rural and logging is a big thing. So, um, you know, these logging trucks come in and they just barrel right over these, you know, these gravestones. And this was, this was a case where um, some of the stones were actually pulled out of the ground. I mean, these are some of those big, you know, the big marble, um, stel stel right. And somebody just pulled, ripped them right out of the ground. But, um, and we had one property owner recently who had his property logged and I think he actually delineated the cemetery with flagging tape and they still ran over it and damaged some of the stones. So this is, this is one of the threats we have to some of, our, some of these um, family cemeteries in the southern part of the county. Um, and here are a couple of examples of family cemeteries that have gone through the development process. Um, this is the Steed Family Cemetery, which is located in a housing development in Fort Washington. So in this case, the cemetery was put on a building lot and there's no homeowners association. So we got a call about, I'd say five or six months ago, the property owner called my uh, supervisor and he, he, he says, um, I have the cemetery on my property, will you come and clean it up for me? And he's like, well, it's on your property and it's your responsibility. No, 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 you need to come here and clean it up for us, it's, it's, it's getting out of control. And so we had to, uh, several of us went out there and we uh, met with the property owner and we said, you know, this is on your lot and it's your responsibility and it's one of our county historic sites. So um, we're trying to work with the property owner to clean it up and if, um, if it's not cleaned up, we're going to take this to our Historic Preservation Commission as a property of concern and see if they can start pushing, pushing back with this homeowner to get this cemetery cleaned up. I think until the, the property owner told us until about five or six years ago, there were family members still visiting and I suspect that they were trying to, the family members probably were maintaining the cemetery, but they, they said they hadn't showed up in about five or six years. So uh, I guess they figured out, oh, we can just let it go. And, but you know, now it's become a nuisance to them and they want somebody else to clean it up. So that's an issue. Um, this is one that Robert Mosco worked on. This is the uh, Skinner Family Cemetery in Nottingham. And uh, this was one of our county historic sites as well. There was a house associated with the site which was uh, demolished. It was in pretty bad condition um, through the development process. But through that development process, because we did have our, um, our cemetery regulations, the owner was required to, um, to restore the stones and Robert restored the stones. And part of the fence was still um, around the cemetery, but it was in bad condition. So the, the, the fence was replicated um, to look like the original fence. So um, this is one where there is an HOA and they are maintaining the this, this cemetery. Um, a, few, a few years ago, again, I get this call. Um, yeah, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna fool with the cemetery anymore. Does park and planning want it? <laughs> and we're like, no, this is your responsibility and you need to, you know, we can't take any more cemeteries. We already have enough and we have a hard enough time getting park and planning our own organization to, to maintain them. So, but they are maintained, I check on it occasionally and um, they are maintaining it, but um, you know, 
we, we, get, we get these calls all the time, you know, we don't want to deal with this cemetery anymore, can you take it from us? So um, one of the other issues is, um, and I think is, this is similar to the other counties, um, a lot of these cemeteries, if you go into the tax records, um, in, our, in our GIS system, PG Atlas, you can click on the um, parcel and it will come up with the you know, owner's name and all kinds of stuff. And so a lot of these, you click on it and it says unknown. And when the county goes to these tax records and they see a property that has an unknown owner or it's you know, vacant, you know, they can't figure out who the owner is, well, what happens? They want to collect their tax dollars from these parcels. And rather than do research to figure out why, you know, there's no name attached to this parcel, they put it up for tax sale. And so people buy these parcels at tax sale and then, they, then we get a subdivision that comes in and it's like, we want to put three houses on this lot, this vacant lot, and we're like, um, there's a cemetery there, you can't build there. And we've had a couple of cases where people have bought these cemetery properties not knowing what's there and have wanted to develop them. And, you know, we have to tell them, sorry, you can't develop it, it's a cemetery. And actually, I think it was uh, the state's attorney's office that called me about that one. Um, so we caught that one before it was sold, but we have had other cases where these lots have been sold because they're marked as unknown in the uh, tax, tax records. So we need to find some way to tag these in the tax records to say that they're cemeteries. So that's another thing we're going to be working on to try to identify these in the tax records as being cemeteries. Um, so basically, I think that's all I have um, have to say about cemeteries, and um, I guess we'll move on to the next thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.